First of all, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a great honor to be with the distinguished uh, speakers that we have today. Uh, I think I should start with a special thank you to Lorenzo, who gave me the opportunity, who recommended me about 30 minutes ago to come and speak. <laughs> it's a true story. Um, yeah, I guess we had a you know a missing speaker and. Uh, <laughs> I'm putting him on the spot. Um, <laughs> we were supposed to have Fernando Reynares uh, uh, as a speaker. Unfortunately, Fernando had some uh, some family issues and couldn't uh, couldn't be with us with here. And I, I actually I think it's fair for me to convey actually Fernando's very, um, uh, apologies. He's very sorry. I think Fernando has been coming here 12 years in a row or something like that. So he really misses it. But I, uh, <laughs> I recently met uh, met Ibrahim and I thought it was more than fitting for him to fill in for Fernando, and in 35 minutes, you had to prepare the speech. You're fine. So you're I'm good. Fine. Don't worry about it. Uh, you know, as a young guy, you got to take the leap, and that's what I'm going to do. Not a presentation, but I'm going to do my best. Uh, and I'm going to speak with from my own uh, experience. Because, uh, first of all, thank you to Barack, who gave us, uh, to Dr. Barak, who gave us the answers, or attempting to give an answer, because I'm going to raise questions. Uh, so it goes perfectly well. Uh, we're talking about uh, Islamism, and we're talking about the Western world, but I think there's one question that me particularly, I had a hard time, you know, uh, trying to decipher the answer, and I'm going to put it out there. Uh, what happens when we're using the Western world and the Western ideals and ideology, and it actually strengthens Islamist groups? And the specific example is the victory of the Muslim Brotherhood in the elections in Egypt in 2011. Uh, and this is something that I've been thinking of quite a lot in the past couple of years, especially working as a researcher. And I've been meeting with a lot of groups, a lot of American groups, college students who are the perfect audience because they're never politically correct. And they give you the hard questions and they ask flat out, does democracy work in the Arab world? And you know, it's a question. And we're going to keep it as a question because I don't know. Uh, what is a democracy? Is it a poll? a way of deciphering, you know, uh, counting votes? Or is it an ideology? Or is it both? Uh, I can say from a personal experience within my own personal, you know, case study of my village here in Israel where we have democracy and we have municipal elections, that at the end of the day, the votes are counted on clans, on a tribalistic way. If you have a family of 3,000 uh, people who are eligible to vote, you're probably going to have around 3,000 votes in your pocket. Is this a democracy or not? It's a tough question. Uh, how do we perceive democracy? Is it the, you know, the value as a democratic ideal, having the vote of the individual? Or is it just the poll, putting the ballot in the box? Uh, in the case of Egypt, particularly, you know, you're looking at me and I'm young, but I had a bit of experience myself. Uh, and I lived in Egypt in 2011. I was there in the revolution. I saw the revolution itself from the Tahrir Square, and I saw the outcomes as well. Uh, the main aspect that shines like brightly in this revolution was obviously the, uh, the movement of the youth, the ones who were going, uh, who stood against the government, who were out in the streets, who were there on the January 25th, and who made the dramatic, uh, you know, who made the efforts possible for Mubarak to step down and trying to think of how are we going to make a new government. In the eyes of the youth in Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood stole the elections. They did not participate in the, uh, in the riots or in the protests in Tahrir Square before January 25th. They only arrived later on. And they were more part of the protests that came after the revolution. Because one thing I can tell you that there was one, one thing that I noticed of the Egyptian um, attitude, you can put it this way, is that people were very proud of uh, the outset of Mubarak, which, is, which they should, but overly proud maybe. Because when you talk about what's next, no one really had an answer. But everybody talked about the fact that we, as a, uh, as a Muslim community, as an Egyptian community, we were able to st uh, take down this regime. But I think it's a more important step of what do we do after we take down this regime? It's only half of the job. 
Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood stepped in later on in trying to, to become part of the efforts to create the new government. I think one of the biggest things that we saw within this revolution, and particularly since uh, Ms. Raza was talking about the role of women, I think it's important to note that uh, in, on uh, Women is a National Day in March of that year, in 2011, the women stepped out on the streets and were actually calling to be part of the efforts to uh, establish a new government. Unfortunately, they were actually left out. They stepped into the streets, they marched in Tahrir again, in order to put their voice out there. The responses that they received was that this is not your role. You're not part of this discussion. Go back to the kitchen. And these are actual statements that we saw in uh, multiple books that were published from Egypt uh, after the revolution, particularly from the women movement there. And, uh, and it, you might be surprised, but uh, from a lot of the voices that were in the Tahrir Square at a time, it was not the Muslim Brotherhood that voiced these statements. It was actually the men who stood with them, with the women in the Tahrir Square until January 25th, you know, hand by hand. But when it came to the case of power, they didn't want the women to be involved in that kind of a calculation. But let's go back to the Muslim Brotherhood. So at the, after a, a, over a year, it was a, a year and a half almost, I think it was June 2012 when we had the elections. I was there. And surprise, surprise, the Muslim Brotherhood won. The youth received it as a, basically as a stealth. It was, uh, the revolution was robbed from them. And we had an uh, Islamist group who won the election by democracy. And the question is, how do we value that? How do we see that? Is this democracy really? Are we, can we support this kind of a government that has Islamist views? if it won the elections fair and square with the votes of the people. You know, a lot of the people, there's a high percentage of illiterate people in Egypt. And illiteracy combined with religion gave a lot of people the easy choice. Who do you vote for? You vote for something that goes with the Islam. And it was the easiest answer for a lot of people. Who am I gonna vote for? I'm just gonna vote for the Muslim Brotherhood. They're Muslims. Islam is the best way to uh, form a government, and there's no problem in it with the Muslim Brotherhood as, a, uh, as the uh, representative of this country. And people did. And obviously, at the end of the day, they won the elections. The only problem is that the youth did not accept this uh, change, and they did not accept this victory. And there was another round of protests against the newly established government until it collapsed. The question is, can we accept, the, can we take these uh, protests of the youth as justified? Because like we said, there are two parts for democracy in elections. The poll and democracy as an ideology, as a, as a belief. And at the end of the day, if we're gonna look at the population of 100 million Egyptians, the youth, and more, more precisely, the moderate youth, at the end of the day, they're a minority. They're not the majority. So if you're gonna go for elections, even though they were the ones who took the leap and they were the first people on the ground and fighting for uh, a, new ch uh, a change in Egypt, the majority of the people thought otherwise. So how do we decide, is this rightful or not? These are the questions in terms of westernization and how do we perceive in the Western world the, uh, what happens in the Middle East? What, do we take or do we accept the Western ideology at all its aspects? And do we accept the vote of the majority, even though it's actually different than our own ideology or not? Uh, the Egyptians, and I was actually very surprised by this, are actually, well, at least from my own experience, there was a lot more radical, uh, uh, I would say, uh, perception of what Israel is, for instance. 
And we're not talking about the Muslim Brotherhood. I'm not talking about the older generation. I'm talking about the youth, the ones who were with me in the university, and it was in American University. And even the youth, the ones who were going for the revolution, they had hugely anti-Semite statements and beliefs and ideologies. But they're the, they're the moderate. Who is the moderate? It really is difficult to say, but when you hear the perception of some of the people or some of the youth in Egypt and how do they perceive Israel, you might be surprised that it's not Islamist, particularly when part of the Islamist movement is an anti-Semite one, like uh, Ms. Raza stated. And here it becomes, honestly, something that is, <laughs> for me at least, as somebody who lived there, it was an internal battle for a few years. Because at the, at the beginning, because I was part of those youth, I saw the ones who were actually in the revolution, in the Tahrir Square, uh, the young women who were standing in tents and healing the wounded, that for them it was a heartbreak of a loss in the elections, and it was stealing the elections. But, you know, you go back, you think about it from the outside, and the elections and the polls and uh, what is really a democracy, and then you wouldn't know. You know, for me, I'm still thinking about it. And I think it was the best for way to, you know, highlight the West and the perception of Islamism by raising questions. Because, honestly, I don't have the answers. Uh, but I do have the questions, and they've been with me since 2011 till today. Because you can see a youth that is a, a moderate one, but you can look at it in a radical perception as well. You can see an older generation or the majority of the country as a, a population that wanted to vote for an Islamist ideology, but it was the role of the majority, which is what happens in a democracy. I won't bore you too long, you know, I wasn't that prepared, but I was prepared enough to raise some questions, and I think these are questions that need to be asked. We need to put these things on the table because not everything is flat out black and white. I think almost everything is gray. Everything is in the middle. And when we talk about Islamism and what is Islamism and this uh, differentiation, uh, particularly in the role of government, especially when we look at our allies in the region, we look at countries like Saudi Arabia, for instance, that we just mentioned, what is Islamist and what line do we draw of making collaboration with these uh, communities? Do we collaborate with, why with Saudi and Taliban or ISIS? And yeah, these are the questions that need to be on the table. And I think sometimes we like to hide from these kind of topics because they don't always make us look in a, the greatest way. But I just wanted to put them right here. Thank you so much.